Before World War II, cities grew in a much different way, and the average family structure as well as transportation systems had gone through a drastic change. To win the war, an explosion of industrial capacity and innovation unlike ever before resulted in a much different world, with greater transportation options and greater desires. The family of the 50s envisioned a life outside the mixed-use city into a more serene, far less dense, safer settings, and the suburban boom was born. Home brings a sense of security to a man. And to every woman, her home means a setting for gracious living. And we'll have the living room right in here. And the kitchen right here so we can see the children playing in the yard. Along with the new suburbs was the adoption of transitional zoning, resulting in the inclusionary separation of social strata. Those could afford the promise of a nice home on a nice lot with space for kids to play abandoned the city. Those who could not afford to leave remained, planting the seed for blight. Until the turbulent 1960s, dad was the breadwinner and mom stayed at home as her place was in the laundry room, not the boardroom. That family unit was about to change and the suburban lifestyle along with it. Mom began to have her own standards and need her own transport and family members had more hobbies and interests with an increased income to feed their desires. The two income family was able to afford a more impressive home with more garage spaces requiring even a larger lot. City planners set zoning patterns which transitioned along arterial streets with strip-style retail, then high-density attached housing, transitioning to lower-density attached or detached homes, then small lots transitioning to larger lots. Thus, today's zoning patterns position the most population in the worst possible places and the lowest density in the best locations. It also showcases city after city with the lowest price homes, which lowers the impression as one drives through the town. As a land planning firm, we started to question the logic of this pattern and found it quite, well, illogical. How could it possibly be good for the land developers we serve to place the cheapest homes along the entrance? What was the logic to pass through cheaper homes to arrive at that estate lot? How can it possibly be sustainable if the city appears to be of a lower income than the average residing within? After months of experimentation, we came up with the formula, the connective neighborhood design. With the CND, we place better housing along the arterial streets, but designed in a way to showcase the development better. This creates an inviting drive along the arterials and increasing the overall impression of those passing through the city. We then transition in pockets to lower income strata. If the architectural detail is not in the budget, these pockets will be less visible. Thus lower income groups enter the neighborhood passing through nicer homes, enhancing their pride in the place they dwell. If the site has natural or man-made amenities, why not place the highest, not the lowest density in those locations? By looking at population density and not income density, you create better places for people to live, which should result in longer-term stability of the region. The final element of the CND comes in a connective pedestrian system along with new ways to design commercial strip malls to reduce or eliminate loading docks adjacent to residential areas and create a more cohesive relationship. In conclusion, no one can argue that the suburban transitional pattern is dysfunctional and quite possibly unsustainable. While there is no utopian design that's perfect solution, the CND serves to cure many of the suburban growth problems as cities move forward in growth and for large areas that could be redeveloped.